You're listening to Affected by Altitude, a Colorado Rockies podcast for and by Rockies fans on Rocky Mountain Rooftop. Thank you for joining us as we discuss all things baseball and Colorado Rockies. Hello and welcome to Affected by Altitude, the Colorado Rockies podcast on Rocky Mountain Rooftop, a proud affiliate of the Fans First Sports Network. I'm your host, Evan Lang, and with me today, as always, is my partner in crime, Skylar Timmons. Skylar, how are you doing this morning? Uh, same old, same old. How much does the Rockies have to do with that same old, same old? Eh. Eh. <laughs> well, before we get started and we elaborate a little bit further on that, um, have a little bit of a interesting thing here. We did this last week as well, but Fans for Sports Network is doing a giveaway. Attention sports fans, are you a fan of an NFL team? Would you love to attend your favorite team's week one game? Well, you're in luck. Fans for Sports Network is giving away four free tickets to the week one NFL game of your choice up to $5,000. The rules to enter are simple. Go to contest.fansfirstsports.com and fill out the appropriate information, and that's it. Once you've done that, you've officially been registered to win the four free tickets to any Week 1 NFL game. What are you waiting for? Go enter for your shot at seeing your favorite team in action. Contest ends September 4th. So when you're hearing this, it's the last day to do it. So enter. Do it. Do it now. Get to if you the want contest. a chance for what is an absolute steal, with especially with how much NFL tickets cost these days, uh, for a home game, especially with week one, it's finally the NFL season. This is an amazing deal. Four tickets uh, up to a value of $5,000 to see the NFL team of your choosing. So, yeah, like Skyler said, last day to enter if you're listening to this right now on the day it goes up. So head on over to contest.fansforsports.com and enter today. Mm-hmm. And then on a much less fun note, we have to talk about the Colorado Rockies. so the first thing is kind of a positive and that is that the rockies finally did something that should have been done a month ago and that is the release of left fielder jerkson profar uh jerkson profar during his time with the rockies just really never put it together uh, by wins above replacement, one of the single worst players in the entire league this season, not hitting particularly well uh, with an OPS of 680 and an OPS plus of 76. He did have eight home runs, but that was about it. And we had been talking for a while, Skyler, that the Rockies should have parted with Jerks and Profar after the trade deadline regardless. And it took them far too long for them to do it. He had way too many at bats and way too many plate appearances and started way too many games after the trade deadline had passed. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it was a tough one for him. No, because like we said, we, we liked the signing at the beginning. No, oh, in spring training. Yes, it was an overpay, but with Sean Bouchard going down with an injury and all this other stuff, it was that desperation move. And <laughs> Profar, Gambled on himself, not you know, opting out of his contract with the Padres. Trying to get a longer, better deal, but then nobody wanted him. And so then the Rockies had desperation, have to take the bait and sign him for way more than he was worth. And honestly, if you look at Profar's stats this season and his career stats, would anybody really be surprised that he did what he did? He's been, he's been consistently this type of player his whole career, aside from you know, a couple of seasons where he put up 20 home runs. And then in 2022, when he had that 15 home run campaign with the Padres, but his average has never been that great. His on base has never been super, super great. Uh, the Rockies were hoping for more than what Profar was actually capable of delivering, especially as, what did we hear when they signed him? Oh, he's going to be our leadoff guy. He can get on base. He's going to really help our offense score more runs. Yeah, he walked and he would, you know, he didn't strike out a ton, but he was just awful in the clutch. He couldn't really, he wasn't contributing anything worthwhile to a team. 
you know, in a Padres lineup, he could get by with what he's producing because there's less pressure on him. And you can kind of, when he's surrounded by hitters like Jake Cronenworth, Manny Machado, you know, guys like that, Fernando Tatis Jr., I guess not so much Tatis. Steroids. But he was pretty much the player he was always been. So nobody should have been really surprised when he turned out the way he's always been, you know? And so it's good that they finally released him at this point. I guess we had heard there were some, maybe some performance bonuses they were wanting to get him to with the end of his contract and then release him. Uh, so like the Rockies do try to do right by some guys like that, but especially if they like him, which is all we ever heard that they really like jerks and profile, but it was a long time coming and about time it finally happened. Yeah. Um, so that incentive, so Profar was signed late in the, uh, late in the preseason for a, uh, one year, $7.75 million contract. That incentive that Skyler mentioned was an additional $1 million on that contract that vested when he reached 400 plate appearances, uh, Profar with the Rockies had 472 plate appearances. So that, um, that definitely vested. So we ended up paying him $8.75 million for this year. And that was always a little bit of an overpay. It was a very late in the late in the preseason move where, as we said before, it was kind of a, a panic move of Randall Grichik is not available to start. Sean Bouchard ruptured his bicep. We need an outfielder. And so they went and they got Jerks and Profar. Um, fresh off of his performance with the World Baseball Classic, and he had an existing relationship with the hitting coach, Hensley Mullins. But it really is, like, the profar that we got is pretty much the profar that we knew we were going to get, except for his outfield defense took a tremendous step in the wrong direction. One of the worst defensive players in all of baseball this year by DRS, by outs above average, and by ultimate zone rating. It just, it it didn't work. And he made a couple, you know, impressive plays early in the season. But as the season wore on, he looked less and less um, like a strong presence in the outfield. And apparently he had some sort of knee injury that had been bothering him for a while, but that makes it even weirder that the Rockies just continued to throw him out there Mm -hmm. in the 27 games that took place in the month of August. Jerks and Profar played in 18 of them and started in 14 of them before he was, he was finally designated for assignment. And that is just, way too much especially when the Rockies already know that they've got a losing season the this is the month where they finally um, locked down that this is going to be the fifth consecutive losing season for this team and you've got young guys that you could be putting out there and and speaking of those young guys it's with the with the designate for assignment of jerks and profar they finally did what people have been clamoring to do and that is they called up left fielder slash first baseman slash catcher Hunter Goodman, one of the organization's top prospects who had been just lighting the world on fire with the AAA Albuquerque isotopes. But this could have been done sooner, or you could have called up literally anyone else to play instead of Profar, especially if you're looking to get the young guys playing time. Mm -hmm. And like we said, the Rockies are are loyal to their guys. And so I'm sure they'd want to get Profar, Everything that he that they can out of him, hoping he can find some way to contribute down that stretch before they move on to a to another guy. And eventually it just got gets to that point when it's near the end of August. That's about the time when you start cutting bait with guys and you know, tried to give them a chance maybe to sign on with a playoff contending team, but uh ends up signing with the Padres. But it's good to see Hunter Goodman though finally get that call up because he's one of those guys that you just need to see what you've got if he can be part of those plans for the future yeah and hunter goodman had been just so so good in triple a and in double a where his his rise you know we called it meteoric but that's that's really what it was where he went straight basically all the way up from low a fresno to double a Hartford 
in 2022. And then this season, he makes it from double A to triple A and just mashing taters all the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tons of RBIs. He still leads the minor league in RBIs right now um, with a combined 111 with 34 minor league home runs in his 15 games with the Albuquerque isotopes. He had an OPS of 1.321 with nine home runs and 33 runs batted in, in just 15 games. Like that is a crazy red hot performance. And people were, were already saying it's time for Hunter Goodman to be called up. And as the month of August wore on, the more and more inexcusable it became that we're giving regular starts to guys like Jerks and Profar and Harold Castro. And, you know, finally the Rockies call up Goodman, who hasn't hit that first home run yet, but he's been pretty solid so far in his first few games. He's starting regularly at first base. Um, he had a, he had several starts at first base, then one started designated hitter so far. I believe it was four first base starts in the one DH start. He's hitting 333 in 18 at bats with a double and a triple and three runs batted in. He has struck out seven times, so not great. But we knew that about Hunter Goodman coming into this is that he's he's very much one of those three true outcome guys. And you know, the more you give him time, the more he's going to adjust to this big league hitting. And that's what you need to big league pitching. And that's what you need to be doing. That's what we've said you've been needing to do with guys like Elaris Montero for pretty much the entire season is you can't learn to hit big league pitching unless you're facing big league pitching. Mm-hmm. And it's surprising looking at Goodman's things of striking out seven times. I thought he had more walks because look at it watching. You know, the few at-bats that I've seen, he's got that good, solid approach at the plate where, you know, he can lay off some of those pitches, those borderline pitches on the outside. He's got a good eye, and he's just getting caught with you know, a little bit more free swinging. But he's got that potential to really wrangle in that that plate approach because he's taking some good at-bats. He takes some good big league professional at-bats, jumping on the pitch that he knows he can hit instead of watching strike one go by, strike two go by, chase one in the dirt. You know, the Montero special, as I call it. And it's he's got that big league approach where he's got that potential, if he can tap into it, of that power that we've seen, which is like a lot of the guys the Rockies have, is figuring out how can we uncork that power for Hunter Goodman and really any number of guys on this roster, because... The power potential is there, and it's such a waste if you can't get these guys hitting the ball consistently to drive it and get the ball out. And first couple of games, Goodman, when he gets a hold of one, he's blasting them. You know, that one triple that you know bangs off the wall there at Coors Field. He's got that potential, and it's be cool if he can put it together over this month of September and maybe hit sock a couple of dingers and just put the ball in play. I think is the big thing showing that he can make contact, put the ball in play against big league pitching is probably the most important thing for him over this month. Yeah. And we've said that about players in the past where really what you need to be focusing on dialing in is that plate approach and putting the ball in play. The power comes as you, as you start putting the ball in play more and more, your power is going to get there. And that's definitely true of a guy like Goodman. And we saw it for, We've seen it for Ezekiel Tovar. We've seen it for Nolan Jones. We've seen it in some ways for uh, Alaris Montero, who hit a home run uh, in game one against the Toronto Blue Jays in this series. The more you put the ball in play, the more confidence you're getting with your swing, the better you're seeing the ball, the power is going to come. And that's what we saw. Heck, we even saw it with Chris Bryant, where he had finally, before he got hurt, started launching the ball a little bit more we had seen his power numbers go up and that's especially true of hunter goodman i think fans need to have realistic expectations that he's a 23 year old rookie at the tail end of the season trying to figure things out he's probably not going to end the year with anything particularly mind-blowing numbers wise but he has he has the potential and there is no reason for him to really not be in the lineup every day because of his positional versatility. Mm-hmm. Or at the very least, you know, 
you can cycle these guys in more often. Oh, okay, Hunter Goodman starts this day. Now, Michael Tolley, you're getting the start this day. And Montero, now you get the start somewhere. Mixing and matching guys, because that's how it works in the minor leagues. You're always mixing and matching. So you can do that at the big league level, uh, which hopefully Bud Black is more willing to do. If instead of one guy gets a start five days in a row and then off day, get all these guys cycling in. And that's going to, I think, do a lot of good for Hunter Goodman, for Montero, for Tolia. But yeah, I, we don't need to expect anything mind blowing. It would be fun to have just Hunter Goodman just go off in the month of September, which he could, and that'd be great. But it's just evaluating and seeing where does he fit into the Rockies' plans for the future. If he kind of started to do a whole lot in the month of September, then maybe they're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll keep him in AAA for next season, and we'll see if he can work on some things and figure it out. Or if he does pop off, where does that move your plans? What do we evaluate? How do we change the roster to fit him into the lineup and things like that? So moral of the story, get these young guys playing so you can figure out what to do in 2024. Yeah, especially when there's already so many decisions. And uh, another guy that we're going to have to make a decision on is someone who just returned to the big leagues with the roster expansions for the start of September, and that is Sean Bouchard. Um, Sean Bouchard basically seemed like a lock for the opening day lineup after the really incredible cup of coffee that he got in 2022, where in 27 games and 74 at-bats, he had a line of 297, 454, 500. He struck out 25 times, but walked 21 times. Three home runs, two doubles, 11 runs batted in. OPS plus of 157. He was fantastic. And that was after he had been just like Hunter Goodman, murdering the ball down in AAA Albuquerque. And then early in spring training, he ruptures his bicep on a swing. And we think he's out for the entire year. Uh, much like Brendan Rodgers, where he had that shoulder injury, and we thought, you know, B-Rod's not coming back this season. They both rehabbed extremely hard and worked extremely hard to get back here, and now Sean Bouchard is back up with the big league team. And he's a guy who we really are going to want to see, I hope, a lot of appearances from because this team has so many outfield prospects. And mm -hmm. with how good Sean Bouchard was last year, he deserves a fair shake at getting evaluated to see where he fits in with the future of this team. He's a, he's a natural left fielder, but, you know, so is Hunter Goodman. Nolan Jones can play left field. We have so many left fielders in AAA and in AA and all throughout the minor league organization. And, you know, the team's going to have some decisions to make. But it's really awesome to see Sean Bouchard back up. He had his first uh, plate appearance of his 2023 major league season in game one against the blue jays and grounded for an rbi which was it, it's good to see it's good to see him back especially with what could have been a really devastating injury mm -hmm. yeah it seemed with like Brendan Rodgers, <laughs> just absurd freak accident and didn't think we'd see him but now he's back and again it's another one of those things he's basically connor joe again uh, that's kind of the mold he always fit into of that, that spot on the roster of a Connor Joe type where, yeah, it's, it's hard to see, like, where does Sean Bouchard fit in? Because there's such a, a jam and knowing the Rockies, are they going to just hold on to him just because, or do you maybe find a way to trade him just a little minor league trade type of thing? Cause it's notable though, cause you're going to have concerns about that arm or that bicep and I'm sure he's going to be a little bit more hesitant, though more selective on swings. Uh, evidenced by in Albuquerque, in 16 games, he had 17 walks in 16 games, 14 strikeouts down there in AAA Albuquerque. In his brief working down there, had a home run, six RBIs, 12 hits, a couple of doubles in 54 at-bats. So getting on base, scoring runs, and his thing's going to be making contact because he's never been a huge power guy uh, until like 2018. He started to kick it into it and then had those 20 home runs in 2022. But 
he's a solid contact guy that has that power potential and defensive versatility. He's another one of, well, where does he fit on this team going forward? Because he's what? He's 27. So he's another one of those fringe guys where it's, okay, where does he fit in? Do we have a spot for him on this roster? Or are we going to try to flip him somewhere? Type of thing. Because you're going to put more stock in your higher draft picks. He was a ninth round pick in 2017. So in the grand scheme of things, unless he's really, really starting to push it forward, he's another one of those fringe guys where you don't know where he fits in going forward. Yeah, especially with with that age, he's older than Brendan Rodgers. Uh, <laughs> Brendan Rodgers is 26 years old, and then all of the other rookies on this team, Brenton Doyle and Nolan Jones are both 25. Uh, Michael Tolia and Alaris Montero are both 24. Hunter Goodman's 23, and Ezekiel Tovar is 21. And this is a team that's going to keep getting younger and younger, especially with all the guys down in the farm system who are going to be ready to go here next season or the season after so but 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 like we've said the rockies are going to have to make some decisions and probably make some trades to thin out that log jam because Mm -hmm. we just have so many outfield prospects and young guys and i love sean bouchard but it is it's a little tough to see where he fits in for the future of this organization right now i hope he kills it for the remainder of the season because he's awesome really great guy and especially with having come back from such a severe injury um, that quickly. So all we can do is sort of wait and see. Yeah. And it's the month of September with you already have your young prospects playing regularly. How do you get him the more playing time type things? Cause third base is spoken for left fields, pretty much spoken for first base is up in the air mostly, but that's mostly Montero and Goodman there. And then Chris Bryant, if he ever comes back, which we might talk about later. But it, so it's got to figure out what to do with him, just like everybody else. <laughs> yep, that's sort of the name of the game here for the rest of the season is figure out to do with figure out what to do with people. And speaking of the rest of the season, we are going to take a quick ad break here, and when we come back, it's time to talk about what will end up being the final results of the Colorado Rockies 2023 campaign. Stick around and we'll be right back. Thank you so much for hanging on during that ad break. Welcome back to Affected by Altitude. We have something a little bit more unfortunate to talk about right now, and that is where the Rockies sit in the standings on the road to 100 losses, where... A 100 loss season is pretty much inevitable at this point, right, Skyler? Uh, yes. Much like Thanos, it seems like it is inevitable for the 2023 season. Yeah, the Rockies are. I mean, I don't really know how else to put it other than they're pretty bad. They have a record of 49 and 85 right now. What is he told me? They have to go like 14 and 14 for the rest of the season in order to not lose 100 games pretty much yeah and they have a tough schedule i'm pretty sure the worst team on that schedule remaining is the padres and the padres are still probably gonna kick our doors in if we're being completely honest (laughs) yeah it's a rough go of it the rest of the way like the rockies had one of the hardest second half schedules uh and then mix that in with bullpen implosions and the Rockies just kind of beating themselves in a lot of aspects and then wasting good pitching performances or (laughs) they can't hit as well. They just can't get anything to click together and for them to magically turn it around and go 500 the rest of the way, so to speak, to avoid a hundred losses. That's a tall, tall, no thing to ask because we saw month August, the worst August in franchise history. The second time this season, they lost 20 games in a month. They only have one winning season in the month of May with 15 wins. Everything else, they've you know, topped out at nine wins in a month a couple of times. Not a recipe for success. Yeah, and you compare that with 
how other teams did in the month of August. The Seattle Mariners, our counterpart in the Pacific Northwest, had their single best August in franchise history. The Los Angeles Dodgers were on an absolutely insane tear in the month of August. And then you have the Rockies with their worst August in franchise history and just another losing month in another losing season. And a big part of August was the bullpen implosions. It got pretty ugly. And I think we talked about this a little bit last week. I think a huge part of it is how extremely overworked this bullpen is right now with the same guys being thrown out every night, guys like Jake Bird and Brent Suter. I think there's just not a lot of gas left in the tank for -hmm. these guys. I mean, you look at Jake Bird. Jake Bird in August had 12 appearances and 16 innings. Suter had 12 appearances as well. And now you throw Matt Cook into the mix. Cookie's been pitching a lot as well. And he had a little bit of a tough August where in 12 appearances, he had an ERA of 568 in 12.2 innings. And you add that onto the pile of, unfortunately, Daniel Bard just really, really struggling to the point where even in in the lowest of low leverage situations, he's not able to get it done. We saw it in the first game against the Toronto Blue Jays, where if he has any command at all, the ball is going to get crushed. But most of the time, he's walking guys and hitting guys, and it's been it's been really tough to watch for Bard. But even even with the rest of this bullpen, we had those consecutive games of the bullpen just completely melting down late in the game when the Rockies were winning, and that again with the first game of the Blue Jay series, the Rockies were winning in the seventh inning. It was a 5-4 game, and they ended up losing 13-9. to nine. Mm-hmm. That game just went completely off the rails, and it was nice to see you know, the offense sort of sprung to life in the, in the ninth inning there, but it was still a loss, and it was still a game that the Rockies were winning beforehand. Yeah, the month of August really is defined by that like we talked about last week, we aren't losing, we're beating, we're getting beat. And yeah, you, you, there was about six games on their last road trip. They won one game. They could have easily flipped that and gone like six and two or seven and one type of thing. And it's because they can't get it done late in the game where the offense, like the young offense is young. It's a young offense and lately they've been doing pretty well competing and, and trying to stay in games. No, they're getting big hits, some big performances from guys. But then to have all that wasted away by one bad inning from the bullpen or multiple bad innings, it, it, that's deflating. And you know it, it. whereas the bullpen was the strong point early on in the season, they've been overexposed so much this season that then that's now they were – they're now contributing to just this inevitable hurtling towards a hundred losses. And it's, it's a tough thing. And it's a fear of what does the team do if they will win? It's not a matter of if, but more so when they get to a hundred losses, what, what does that do for the organization anymore? Because at this point it's, what are they on pace for like 103, 105 losses the rest of the way? They're on pace for, I think it's 103 after last night. And my expectation, honestly, is that they're going to lose at least 104. And I would not be surprised if they lost even more than that. Um, Before we talk about that, I did want to just share, here are some bullpen ERAs for the month of August, just to to really hammer home how rough it's been. 19.29, 14.73. 12, 11.05, 9 5.3, 8.31, 6.75, 5.68, 5.25. And then we have just three guys with ERAs under four in that month, 3.86, 3.38, and zero. And that zero is one appearance of Gavin Hollowell in the month of August. <laughs> 
it ain't MVP pretty. of the month. <laughs> and it's tough because, and we'll talk, we'll talk about this a little bit later in our, in our, in our players and pitches of the month. But you look at guys like Jake Byrne, Brent Suter, who both had ERAs under four for the month of August in 12 appearances. But we also saw them contribute to a ton of the meltdowns because they're just so overexposed and overworked. Mm -hmm. And then getting back to what Skyler was mentioning is what does a hundred losses do for this team? Do we get the excuse of, well, we had so many injuries that we're going to call it a mulligan. Do we actually see the front office and the ownership realize that what they've been doing for 30 years has not been working at all. And it's all culminated in this, the worst season of Rockies baseball in franchise history. During the 30th anniversary. During the 30th anniversary. Like this is supposed to be a celebration of the team. It's, it's 30th anniversary season. And what fans are rewarded with is the single worst season of Rockies baseball that they've ever had to watch. Mm -hmm. And that's a tall order. We lived through 2005 and 2012 and 2013. We've seen some bad Rockies teams. And this year, especially just it's something else. And you have to wonder what is going to happen in the off season. Cause think about what happened last season, fourth consecutive losing season, bad year. Dick Montfort comes out with his, his letter out to season ticket holders saying, I recognize that the team was bad and we're going to do everything we can to improve the team. And they did nothing. And then Dick Monfort in you know January or February makes his ridiculous promise that he always does, be it the interpolating the numbers from a couple of years ago or this year where he says, oh, well, I think this team can play at least 500 ball. I, I think he's off by a couple of games. At least two, probably three, honestly. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a mathematician. But I'm pretty sure that 500 balls been out of the cards for quite some time. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing is you're going to get the same corporate speak after the season. If it's 100 losses, it's going to be excuses and just corporate speak. There won't be a press conference. We've already grown accustomed to that. The Rockies won't address it. Uh, you'll have to wait for some other random luncheon or buffet or fundraiser event before you hear anything out of anybody. But you know, the season ticket letter will go out. Oh, if we had had, we had this bad season because of injuries and this. But look at these cool things. And like, yeah, we can look at the interesting things of the prospects and whatnot. But what is the team doing to get better? Oh, I'd like to hear. What are you doing to help develop these guys? Are you, you know, are you working with driveline baseball to improve your batters? Are you working with some other baseball facility that works with analytics. Jason Hirsch runs a type of thing like that. Work with him. What can he offer to the team? But instead, it's that one problematic thing of you're going to have 100 losses and nothing will change. Or very, very little will change. Where 100 losses, that's reason enough for your manager to get fired because you got to shake things up. Like the status quo isn't working. And if you're getting 100 losses the first time in franchise history, and there's been some bad teams over the 30 years, and they've managed to avoid 100 losses, even just barely by the skin of their teeth, the team that finally does it, it's reason enough for your manager to be relieved of his duties. Because you just have to change your mindset of where you are as a team. I don't think Bud Black's ready to manage a rebuilding prospect driven team he's wanting it to be he wants that 2017 2018 type of team that was already really built and ready to compete but instead it's just gone downhill because aging veterans that keep getting stacked onto the roster just continue to drag things down and i think this season especially and and again i've i've said this before i'll say it again i like bud black in general i don't think he's a bad manager but this season has exposed a lot of his flaws 
as a manager when it comes to lineup construction and favoring underperforming veterans over the rookies when the rookies need playing time, when it comes to utilizing his bullpen. And it's been, it feels like sometimes that he's on autopilot because he's sending out the same two, three guys every single night. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, you know, defensive strategy, pitching strategy, leaving in guys too long, not giving guys uh, a short enough leech. We, like we saw that during that series with the Washington Nationals when Daniel Bard very clearly did not have any command and was really struggling. He faced eight batters when there's only a three batter minimum. So it's like, you don't necessarily want to see a guy like Bud Black get fired, but I think the time has come and I don't, I don't necessarily think the Rockies are going to come out and say, bud, you're fired. I think we're going to get what we usually get, which is the two came to a mutual agreement that bud would step away from Rockies baseball after, mm -hmm. after this season or something like that. But it's going to be an especially weird and tough off season for Rockies fans because we're coming off the worst season in franchise history the state of the Rockies on TV is up in the air because AT&T Sportsnet Rocky Mountain is gone at the end of this season. It will no longer exist. And we have no idea what the Rockies on TV is going to look like in the future. Meanwhile, much like the end of last season, our neighbors downtown in Lodo are hanging up a banner. As our season limps to a close, they're getting ready to give out rings and hang up a banner at Ball Arena. Mm -hmm. And I... Well it's the same thing as last year. I wrote an article about this last year. I'm going to write an article about it this year where Dick Monfort sends out a letter saying, Oh, I'm sorry that we were bad and we're going to be better. While one of Stan Cranky's teams is hoisting a banner. Mm -hmm. Well, and you look you know, another neighboring town. It, <laughs> people are going to check out on the Rockies for the rest of this season because the more popular team, a more popular sport is starting up in the Denver Broncos. And you look at them, one of their worst seasons last year, uh, just a train wreck of a season. What did they do in the off season? Tried to shake things up, make improvements where they could. They brought in a new head coach because they needed a change in leadership and the cultural you know, aspect of the team. They needed to shake up. And you know, that's what, the Rockies need to do. We saw the Nuggets and the Avalanche go through the painstaking rebuilding process, and they're reaping the benefits now. But the Rockies are going to get 100 losses. They have one of the top chances to get the number one overall pick for 2024, which, hey, that's exciting. But the result, <laughs> how that came about is very depressing. And we're just not seeing the results of the team, and they're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. Where you need maybe younger leadership, a Warren Schaefer type who's been with these guys that he's now coaching at third base. He's managed a bunch of these guys, or he, he's worked with them on his way through the minor leagues. Maybe a change in leadership, bring in new blood, young blood, to embrace analytics, push the team to get more modern, no, and Bill Schmidt and Dick Munford up there in the in the in the purple tower. I don't know if it's made out of ivory, so we'll just call it purple. <laughs> but up there in McGregor Square or whatever, they're hanging out there. They need to honestly look at the organization and realize how far behind they are and reassess where they are. You're not competing in 2024. There's what, what things you can do to help you compete. But the status quo is a bunch of baloney and making excuses that, oh, injuries, injuries, guys. We would have been better if we all our guys hadn't been injured. When your guys weren't injured, they were bad type of thing. Yeah. What are you doing to help your team get better and develop at the big league level? Because it seems like with the Rockies, your prospects, they stop developing a lot of them once you get to AAA. After that, the development doesn't seem to continue on where there's a regression from good things they're doing in triple a Montero strikeout numbers skyrocket at the big leagues, but down in triple a Albuquerque, he draws a lot of walks and manages. He looks like a good solid player. 
Yeah. But as soon he as had, he comes he up, he had had his strike. I, I wrote about this a, a little while ago. He had had his strikeouts largely under control. Mm hmm. And Same now, Natalia. And, and this team is just an absolute strikeout machine. And I'm willing to, you know, give Bam Bam another year or two because, you know, you can't install and completely overhaul a, fit, a hitting philosophy in one year. But I'm of the opinion that a lot of the rest of this coaching staff, who are a lot of Bud and his fellow old guys, I think it's time to move on. I think it's time to move on from bud black and mike redmond and reed cornelius and daryl scott mm -hmm. because when you look at 2005 clint hurdle or whenever clint hurdle gets in 2002 or whatever clint hurdle gets put in and then that's kind of that start of the team slowly rebuilding into generation r and clint hurdle was the perfect manager for that era with the team and then expectations were so high no, they have a solid 2008, but they miss the playoffs. But then they get, they have those high expectations for 2009. Doesn't work out, you know, to the end of, till the end of May, and they fire him. The last time they fired a manager, Clint Hurdle in 2009, like they legit fire him. There was no <laughs> this baloney garbage of a. Oh, we've decided to mutually yeah. part there, ways. There was like, no, there he, was no mutual agreement. <laughs> no, they canned him, and you know, it, I don't know if it was the right decision ultimately because, but they felt the change was needed, and so they took the initiative and and relieved him of his duties. And you no, know, I love I like Clint Hurdle. He was always a good manager. I think he was a good hitting coach too. But they felt the change was needed in leadership at that time to spark it, spark the change. And you always bring in Jim Tracy, who goes on to do good things over the years. And then the Rockies fell in love with him and wanted to give him a lifetime contract, handshake agreement, like Bud Black seemingly kind of has. <laughs> but then he resigns. But it goes on. The players in that 2009 season, what sparked that change? They realized... Clint Hurdle, a manager they loved, would go to bat for him that they adored. He got fired because of how they were playing, and that sparked them like, we got to get our crap together. And they have the best season in Rockies history at, by the end of it. Change is needed, and kind of that jolt to the system can do a lot of good to, to a team. And I think that's something the Rockies need. They need that shot in the arm one way or another. But I hate that we have to sit and wait and hope that Dick Monfort and the front office he's assembled underneath him is, are going to pull their head out of the sand and actually do what mm -hmm. needs to be done. Actually think and take a look at what brought us to this point. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is such a tall order to... Because you know, we've said this a thousand times. Dick Monfort is never selling the team. It's not going to happen going, oh, the only way the Rockies are ever going to be good again is if Dick sells the team. Maybe, but he's not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So the next best thing is that he needs to pull his head out of his behind and realize that his actions and the way that he has run this organization have led us directly to this point. Mm -hmm. And I hate that we have to sit and wait and see if that's actually going to happen. You look at teams that lose 100 games in the season... <laughs> even multiple times, changes have to be made. Those teams don't stay the exact same unless they're purposely purposely doing it, which you know, we saw the Orioles were purposely being bad so they could rebuild. You know, we see Oakland this year purposely being bad because they want to move. But other teams that lose that much, not on purpose because they actually kind of tried, but it's just not working, you got to make changes. And I know the, Rock the Rockies don't owe Bud Black anything because of 2017, 2018. We want him to be here to manage the next contending team. Like, you don't owe that to him. It'd be great if he could, but it, you're not even close to that. And, and we don't even know when the next contending team exactly. is going to be. Like, when they started, when they when we traded Nolan, when we, when we made some of those other changes, it was, Oh, well, we're targeting a contention window of 2023, 2024. 
Well, that's not happening. So what, 2025, 2026, 2027? If you look mm -hmm. at the um the poll that Patrick Saunders and the Denver Post posted, the basically the exit interview poll for the season of when do you think the Rockies will next be competitive? The majority of respondents said not in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see like within three to five years, personally, that's kind of that window type of thing. And is Bud Black really going to keep signing contracts for the next couple of years? Who knows? Yeah. But change has to be made. Something's got to give. You you bring us to the 30th anniversary of this team, which already hasn't been handled particularly well in terms of the fan experience, in terms of how they've been celebrating it. And you add on top of that the single worst season in franchise history. Something's got to give. You got to do something. Mm -hmm. So I look, <sighs> I look forward to that letter. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll have um, chat GPT write it. Sent from my iPad. <laughs> hey, chat GPT it's, it's, is now an app. <laughs> Instead of sent sent from my iPad, it's sent by my iPad. My iPad yeah. composed the letter. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, on that cheerful note, we're going to take another quick ad break and we get back. It is time for August Players of the Month. Hang tight. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Affected by Altitude. Before we get started here with our August Players of the Month, quick thing that we'll mention is it is looking more and more likely like Chris Bryant is being converted into a first baseman. Basically inevitable that when he returns, he will be playing first base. Hey, I like it because it's the most logical move they could make with Chris Bryant and that contract. I definitely get it. It's, it's where he's least likely to get injured again. It is where his not particularly great defense over the last couple of years is going to do the least amount of damage. Over his career. And it, it gets him in, in the line of every day at either first base or DH. What I don't like is the way too big of a number of players that we will have to figure out what to do with because of that. And that's Michael Tolia, Hunter Goodman, Alaris Montero, Grant Levine, a bunch of different guys. What do we do with them? You can't it's trade a... them all, or can you, I guess? Oh, you can. <laughs> but the Rockies aren't going to. Yeah. Trade them, you release them, you do whatever you can. You're stuck with that contract. Chris Bryant's your top priority, getting him on the field. You have to make room for him. Other fringe guys, you no know, guys that are one or two year deals, uh, those lower leveraged players in contract land, those are the ones that you figure out what to do with them. But a big contract superstar like Chris Bryant, yeah, if he's you need him to play first base, you stick him there. He's your first baseman for the next five years. And because of that, you're going to have to trade away guys or, or just release them because they're not, not panning out and you don't have room for them. It's a harsh reality, but that's how baseball works. That's baseball <laughs> type of thing. And there's so many outfield prospects with talent that are coming. So that puts Michael Tolia on the chopping block. Montero's on the chopping block. Grant Levine, and maybe he gets picked up in a Rule 5 draft. Because the Rockies kind of, he's not high on that priority list of first basemen. And there's tons coming. Mm -hmm. So Chris Bryant, first base, that's your staple. If he wasn't on that five-year contract, then you could figure out things a little easier. But if he's has to be first your primary first baseman for the next couple of years, go for it because his bat still still can provide. And he's he's got a good glove over there, first base. He can make some picks and receive the ball pretty easily. Yeah, we've watched him do a little bit of uh, fielding practice as he's working back from that hand fracture. And he can he can perform the the job over at first base. It's just frustrating because we have we have all those other guys. And if I'm being honest, I don't think Alars Montero or Michael Tolia are on this team next year. Either they're going to be traded or they're going to be cut. Uh, I see Tolia as an extra bench piece. 
just because he can play outfield and first base, so he can be your backup first baseman. But so can Hunter Goodman. It just depends on who's who's hitting or who think, can hit. I think Grant Levine is going to be odd because he has sort of stalled out at Double A. This is his second year at Double A, and he's not moving up to Triple A this year. It seems like mm-hmm. it's. I don't know. There's going to be a lot of decisions to be made. And you're right, is that we are stuck with the Chris Bryant contract regardless of what we do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, by the end of that contract, maybe Kyle Karos will be ready to take over at first base or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. But it, the idea is the priority is to keep him healthy and get him on the field. He wasn't doing much in the outfield that contributed to leg and foot injuries, back injuries, probably. But first base, no stress on the body. He's a solid. He's had um, in the like thirty some odd games he's played at first base in his big league career. He's done well. I think he's only made one error, so he can handle it just fine uh, when he doesn't have to throw the ball anywhere <laughs> or try to track stuff down. So you can handle that, and then that can maybe then bleed into helping his bat, focusing on his bat and everything because his body will be fresher from not having to try to run down fly balls and all that jazz. Yeah, uh, he's uh, he can be a perfectly cromulent first baseman. Mm-hmm. In 212 uh, and one-third innings, he has one error mm-hmm. with 17 assists and a fielding percentage of .995. Yeah. That, is, pre- that is perfectly cromulent. Yeah. Because it's pretty apparent when somebody isn't very good at first base. And Chris Bryant is perfectly fine there. He can handle it just were fine. Ian Desmond and Daniel Murphy. Yes. Because because at least Chris Bryant has played it. He has experience in that position prior to joining the Rockies to take over it full time. It's going to be a weird one. Like we said, it's going to be a weird, confusing, complicated offseason for a bunch of different reasons. And we'll see if Chris Bryant even comes back this season. They keep, they keep saying he will, but there's only a month left. There's still no specified timetable for his return. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I have no idea. We'll see. That's why you got to cycle through Montero, Goodman and Tolia at first base. Seems like Tolia's they've kind of, he's an outfielder now, but Montero and Goodman, figure out who can who can be a backup first baseman there for us type of thing and sliding at dh so yeah chris bryant first baseman in the future it worked in mlb the show for me <laughs> when i had to rebuild a team and i still had his contract and moved him from left field had him as my dh and then season i needed to have him at third base and then eventually i signed a third baseman and moved him to first worked out pretty good you know, I've never actually sat down and done franchise mode in MLB The Show. Franchise mode fantasy draft. It's the best. Never tried it. I'll have to at some point. I don't know. I got kind of burned out on MLB The Show, though. just because I played so much of 21 and 22. And then this year just it wasn't that. There No major changes. Just didn't really feel that good to play. But that's not what we're, we're supposed to be talking about. What we're supposed to be talking about now is our August Players, Pitchers, and MVP of the month. And in case you don't remember how this works, we do it every month. Um, We look at the stats of the guys from the month of August, and we decide who our best position player, who our best pitcher, and our overall MVP is for that month. And we're going to go ahead and get started with the position player. And I don't know if you'll agree with me on this, Skyler, but... I feel as though we have no choice but to give it to one Charles Cobb, Chuck Nasty, Blackman. You're wrong. Okay. (laughs) Uh, He's my runner-up. You probably have... Your number one is probably who I have as my runner-up. But let me go why I'm I'm choosing Chuck here. Is he finally came back here in August. He played 15 games. And in those 15 games, he put up an OPS of 1.077. He was a clear and immediate emotional morale and leadership boost to a, a rudderless team. And he backed it up with his performance 
as well. So while he didn't play a ton in the month of August, really pretty much just half of the month, he still hit 377, 492, 585. He drew nine walks, struck out just five times, six RBIs, two home runs, two triples, and a double. Mm-hmm. He still got the wheels, that Chuck Nasty. And it's always nice to see him work. He's played out in the outfield some. You know, long gone are the days where Chuck is a is a prime outfielder. But he is still at least out there, and he's put in the effort every day. And mm-hmm. that's what I really appreciate about Charlie Blackman. But, Skyler, why don't you tell me who your choice is? Because I'm pretty sure I know. Uh, I'll touch on Charlie Blackman here real quick, though, too. Because, yeah, he was my runner-up. And it, it's because he's he's making that impact. He's back on the field, and he's making those intangible you know, impacts. They're in that clubhouse, being a leader. But, yeah, then he's doing it on the field, out of the leadoff spot again. And yeah, the, the, he's not getting the power, but he's getting on base, putting together professional at bats. He's doing a lot for the team, but I couldn't also couldn't ignore my my guy. I wanted to give it to Nolan Jones for the month. Oh, just seems like he he's made a great spot for himself on the team, an everyday player, always making an impact with the bat. It seems, or he's he has his moments coming up big. He's thrown out some solid performances. In the month, four home runs, drove in 17 runs. No, he's, yeah, he still strikes out a good amount. He's 37 strikeouts, but he's still offsetting that with putting the ball in play. He drew 13 walks. That was second on the team uh, behind Ryan McMahon in the month. But he had 27 hits, nine doubles, had a triple. He's just continued to exceed expectations and put up solid, solid numbers. Still 281 average, 369 on base, a 521 slugging, OPS of 890. So there's still things he can improve on, but when I think of just the sheer amount of offensive production he's providing to the team and continue to do that, plus what he does in the outfield, now in like, what, the 60-some-odd games, already one of the leaders in outfield assists this season, franchise record for a rookie outfield assists. I couldn't pass up giving it to Nojo, but Charlie Blackman, yes, is a very close, and I would be fine with either one winning. Yeah, and and for all of those reasons you listed, Nolan Jones was my runner-up, where if I hadn't gone with Chuck, it would have been Nolan, because Nolan has just been an absolute joy to watch pretty much every single night. He does something cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, where it's like Charlie Blackman, he's getting on base. He's scoring the runs. 13 runs scored in the month. Nolan Jones scored 15. But uh, Nolan Jones is also just having those opportunities to drive in more runs just from where he's hitting in the lineup because of Charlie Blackman. Whereas Charlie Blackman doesn't have as many opportunities because the bottom part of the Rockies lineup is more or less like we're throwing out two or three pitchers at the bottom of the lineup, hitting-wise. But yeah. Both good choices, I think. And Skyler, who is your pitcher of the month? The little cat, Ty Balake. Uh, I agree Ty, with you on this one. Because Ty Block, oh, it, kind of the surprising one. You no, know, started the season on the roster as kind of our long reliever, lefty. Eh, kind of struggled. That's what he was last year. Sent him down to Albuquerque at some point after we outrided him off the roster. No, he only got outrighted once, didn't he? I believe so. Once or twice. Or is Fernando Abad that got dumped twice? Yeah, but Fernando we send Abad him, was the one who got dumped twice. We send him down to AAA, and they kind of start turning him into a starting pitcher again. He gets to start again, and then they call him up, and basically <laughs> just circumstances, the, ro- the rotation has just been so decimated, we need something. Ty Block has experience starting. No one had some bright spots, and he comes in and he, you no, know, back to old form, finding success, pitching, you no, know, in that rotation, and puts up the best, the best uh, ERA out of the month. Five starts, a three point seven one ERA in twenty six and two thirds innings, gave up eleven runs on twenty seven hits, four home runs, seventeen strikeouts to nine walks. Uh, he put up some solid, solid outings in the month of August. Coming in was just a bolster where he he's just works quick, he's efficient, and it's it's 
cool to see he's just that big boost to give the team a chance to win where he put up quite a few. Uh, he, he went at least five innings in most of his starts. The most runs he gave up in an outing was four runs in four and two thirds against St. Louis at the beginning of August. And you no, know, just kind of turned it up since then. After that, it was six innings, five innings, four innings, seven innings in his last outing on the 27th, one run on three hits in seven innings against the Baltimore Orioles. So, he faced some tough teams in August and did pretty solid against all of them. Yeah, and for Ty, he he hadn't really been a regular starter for quite some time. And then late in July is when the Rockies finally called him into service. All right, we need you to start ball games. And he's he's really delivered. And it's 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 really nice to see because you like Ty Block and it you know, you you have the story of he's the Colorado native who is now pitching for his hometown team. But it really is in in a month where multiple members of that rotation were struggling. You know, Kyle Freeland gave up 11 home runs uh, in 33 and two-thirds innings. Peter Lambert's been okay. Chris Flexen, you know, Austin Gomber's been solid, but now his back is hurting him again, which super concerning because he has that history of the back fracture. But then you have Ty Block, who's just going out, going out there and pitching his guts out every single time. And it's not always going to be pretty or perfect. You know, he has nine walks to seventeen strikeouts, and he has given up four home runs. But what is what he is doing is getting out there and pitching a decent number of innings, and like you said, giving the team its best opportunity to win. And that's why I think Ty Block is indeed our pitcher of the month. Mm-hmm. Very much so. So then the question is who our MVP is. And I think, Skyler, you are probably going to pick Nolan Jones. I'm going to break our rules again and say Charlie Blackman and Nolan Jones as co-MVPs. Okay, I'm down with that. I'd honestly actually put all three of these guys. Do we want to break really break the rules and have triple MVPs? (laughs) One for each letter. Uh... No, I'll leave it to just our duo of position players for me. All right. But yeah, Charlie Blackman and Nolan Jones really have been the reason to watch Rockies baseball in a month where the Rockies went 7-20. and 20. Mm-hmm. It's like you combine the two of them and they are driving that Rockies offense in a way. Because Chuck's getting on base and eventually Nolan Jones is hopefully driving him in. Man, what a month. I'm really glad it's over. What's that? We have another month to go? No. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's a toughie. After we finish this, uh, this series with the Blue Jays this weekend, we're heading out to Arizona and San Francisco. <laughs> no. We have a three-game series with the surprisingly good Chicago Cubs. Yeah. A four-game set with the Giants again. No, <laughs> those are never fun. Uh, three game set with the Padres. Eh? Another three game set with the Cubs. Eh? A four game set with the Los Angeles Dodgers. In the <laughs> no, that's going to be rough. Uh, and, and where is that at? Coors Field or it's at it's Coors. Uh, but hey, Math Day is one of those days. <laughs> Woo! Hey kids, let's calculate how bad the Rockies run differential is. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and then we finish out the season with a three game set against the Minnesota Twins. Hooray! And that is why you look at that schedule. That's why we said earlier, the idea of the Rockies playing 500 ball for the last month of the season is an absolute pipe dream. Mm -hmm. But we'll be here for it, as we always are, here at Affected by Altitude. Skyler, where can the folks find you at on the socials? Uh, You can find me on the Twitters at sideline underscore crowd or X. Uh, but yeah, that's the main thing. And right in Wednesday, rock piles. Also, go find our articles over at fansfirstsports.com. 
where you can find articles and also the podcast and all that good stuff. Uh, all that support goes really well to helping support us and the show. Uh, yeah, what I have seen, basically everyone I've been seeing doing it, including the, um, uh, what's it called? Including like most news outlets, everyone's just calling it X formerly known as Twitter instead <laughs> of just calling it X or just calling it Twitter. But yeah. I'm still going to call it Twitter because X is stupid. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Evan underscore Lang 27. I'd love to hear from you. Also on Blue Sky at, at Evan Lang 27 dot BSKY dot social. You can find me on Purple Row doing those Thursday rock piles and on Fans for Sports Network. You can also find us on the Affected by Altitude and Rocky Mountain Rooftop Twitter account, which is at Rocky Mountain Rooftop. That's at R O C K Y M T N Rooftop. And you know, Skyler, I think that's uh, I think that's going to do it for us today. What do you think? Uh, yes, go check out every Rocky ever new episode recently dropped. Very good episode. Alex Cole, other deceased Rockies, late Rockies, fun conversation. It was a very good episode. Definitely check it out. All righty. Well, that's going to do it here with us on Affected by Altitude. We will see you next time, Skyler. Hit them with it. Farewell. Charlie Brown.